Spider silks. They're light, they're strong. Finding a way to make them in the laboratory could change the very fabric of our lives. Also, researchers are building a new tool that could pull vastly more information out of one drop of your blood. A powerful new test that could head off diseases and save lives. And we'll show you how all those germ-killing compounds we like to buy may be doing us more harm than good. This YouTube edition of Catalyst is brought to you by Arizona PBS and Arizona State University. Life has problems. Science turns them into questions that can lead to solutions and even innovations. It's Catalyst. When you see a spider, how do you react? How about when you see a spider's web? Science is now showing us that the silks spiders spin to make their webs are some of the most remarkable substances on Earth. Incredibly strong, yet strangely lightweight and elastic. And the race is on to find ways for us to duplicate these amazing materials and put them to work in our lives. Here's a riddle. What's stronger than the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco? Thinner than sewing thread, yet safe enough to suspend a 200 pound human several hundred feet up in the air. Grab your hiking shoes and carabiners as we answer that question, scaling the face of Pinnacle Peak Mountain. That's where Matt Starr is taking a few friends out to climb the challenging cliffs on a sunny afternoon. If you want to have fun, you got to trust your gear. The, I, the, the concept that your gear is going to hold is one that you really need to personally accept. Otherwise, the whole time you're gonna be worrying and you're gonna, you're gonna be afraid and you're gonna fall. Before World War II, ropes were made of natural fibers like this and often snapped before they stretched. Scientists looking for a better way to help soldiers make safer yet more daring deployments developed dynamic nylon rope that stretches. So that when you fall, you don't just slam into the rock right away. It, get, it has some give, it allows you to fall more slowly. Nylon manufacturers warn climbers even the best dynamic rope can break after a year of heavy use. The idea of dangling like Spider-Man free of fear has turned climbers and scientists' attention to the miracle of spiders. Spider silk is very elastic and it is very strong. If we could make it bigger, like those properties would be awesome. Like think of being able to like withstand like a bullet being shot at it. Like those are great mechanical properties and that's why everyone cares. In the abdomen of a spider, they're able to store protein solution for weeks or months at a time. And at will, with their leg, grab the end of that with their spinneret and pull out a fiber, you know, in millisecond time scales that, you know, now is insoluble in the original uh, solution it was in. It's no longer soluble in water. A web doesn't, you know, uh, dissolve when it rains outside. Um, and, you know, they can pull all these, you know, up to six different silks, you know, out of their spinnerets at will out of these aqueous stored environments. Dr. Jeffrey Yarger, the director at the Magnetic Resonance Research Center, is Arizona State University's Spider-Man. You know, what we need to know is the genetic information. What genes encode these proteins so that we can now make those proteins and in a sense make spider silk? Because if you take any other protein and put it into solution, it would never reach the concentration levels that the, pro that the spider can achieve. So how does the spider, one, keep those proteins separate? in random, but then on demand, make it in the super fiber. To get to that answer, Yarger's team must investigate three key structures in the spider silk's biological makeup. So to break it down, there's primary structure, secondary structure, tertiary structure. And primary structure of something is like, what sequence of amino acids like make this thing? Secondary structure would be like, all right, you have your sequence, how does it how does it fit in space? Like, does it take on a helix? Does it take on like these sheets? And then you have tertiary structure, like, all right, how does it, how does this like uh, secondary structure work with other secondary structure things? And then you get big enough, big enough, you have like a protein. We know primary sequence, no one knows secondary structure. And we can't recreate synthetic spider silk without knowing how to put it together. So the ultimate goal of this lab is figuring out structurally what does silk 
look like at the atomic level. To get to the atomic level, Dr. Yarger's lab must look into the spider's home with a high power magnetic resonance imaging scanner. So first, um, to do MRI on a spider, I would take that spider and anesthetize it, then place it into what we call the MRI probe, and then insert it to the center of the large magnet behind me. Then I would look at the basic anatomy of the spider um, to locate where the silk producing glands are that I'm interested in studying, to learn about the proteins and their behavior, structure, dynamics inside the, the spider. What we're trying to do is, is biomimicry, you know, as a short version. We're trying to mimic what spiders are able to do. The very interesting materials they're able to make, what genes make these proteins, how they aggregate and form these hierarchical structures to form these, you know, incredibly tough fibers. We would love to have polymer processing that are that environmentally friendly. <laughs> To understand the spider and their ways, Dr. Yarger's researchers handle hundreds of species. Some are harmless, others not so much. But each have unique properties his team hopes to learn from. I expect a lot of people to be very afraid of spiders and, and not want to have anything to do with it. Like, just tell me when I have the silk and I'll come and do the chemistry and the more scientific stuff, but keep the spiders away from me. When I started working with spiders, it was more like, I like had face mask on, goggles on, coats on. This this wasn't a thing. This was like all the way down here, two sets of gloves, like, what do I do with this thing? Like afraid to touch it, like using tongs, like <laughs> very scary at first. But then you get used to it when you realize that it's probably more afraid of me than I am of it. I'm I'm actually astonished sometimes by uh, that, you know, uh, level of comfort that people get so quickly. By overcoming the fear of spiders, scientists are closer to understanding the wonderful web they weave. We've solved the molecular structure of, of several silks now, several of the important ones that people want to use in textiles. And it's not until very recently, in the last couple of years, that people have made synthetic silks that are close enough to natural silk and properties that it's really become useful to companies like Adidas, who's using it in shoes, companies like North Face that are using it in textiles to make jackets. None of them have the characteristics that true spider silk has. Like, it's not exact, it's not perfect yet. So there's always work to be done just as there are always mountains to climb. Woo. The advice we often get to prevent the spread of germs is wash your hands and do it often. Soap can kill germs, and so can a lot of other compounds. Compounds that for years have been added to soaps, hand sanitizers, and even simple objects like pens and pencils, all of them with the promise of killing germs but a team of researchers at Arizona State University have been taking a hard look at those compounds, and they've been finding some unexpected and undesirable consequences. In America, um, a woman has a 97% chance of having detectable levels of triclosan, an endomicrobial, in her breast milk, meaning that the first meal that a baby gets typically is laced with endomicrobials that come from personal care products. We'll start in a very dirty place. That's Dennis Porter on the left. He's the assistant director of water services for the city of Phoenix. On his right, Dr. Rolf Halden. This is where all the wastewater for a large portion of the Phoenix Valley comes in uh, to this primary treatment area. Wow, so we have five cities contributing to this. We, we do. Phoenix, Scottsdale, Tempe, Glendale, and Mesa, all the wastewater flowing together. All the wastewater comes to here. here. So between our two plants, we treat about two, two and a half million persons worth of wastewater. But for us, you know, it's also very exciting because as you combine the waste of all these people, you actually add a lot of information. We do. That you have access to, and so you can see not only how much water people are using, but also what people are doing on that given day. So, you know, the coffee you drank in the morning and right. the nicotine and all these things are showing up in the wastewater. Now, wastewater sounds terrible, right? Something that you don't want to see, smell, or, you know, <laughs> have any exposure to, right? But think of it as combined biospecimens from many people. Rather than looking at blood of an individual, we look at the wastewater of the whole city. 
And so we can see all the things that are happening in the city with respect to chemical profiles. And so this was a rather simple question. What happens to antimicrobials um, that we use in soap and they get washed down in the sink? Makers of personal care products grabbed hold of these antimicrobials because they saw a way to improve the power and appeal of their products. Before long, we were seeing them in not just soaps, but toothpastes, deodorants, clothes, cutting boards, even office and school supplies. There was over a million pounds of a chemical known as triclocarban being produced in the United States. And that was back in the year 2002. And uh, there was no information on what happens to this chemical once we are done washing our hands and it gets rinsed off into uh, the sink and then goes to the wastewater treatment plant. In fact, substances like triclosan and triclocarban can get in the way of the work of beneficial bacteria, good bacteria that help us treat wastewater to make it clean. So in essence, what we're doing here is, is mimicking nature, just doing it in an engineered way, packed, concentrated, and very efficient, right? That's exactly right. What we have is, is a wastewater with a lot of nutrients, but what you're doing is you're concentrating the bacteria in these tanks. They're so hungry, that's, that's a, they, they eat everything. <laughs> that's <laughs> they, a really good description. And well, this is kind of, really kind of sort of the heart of the liquid treatment process. You see the problem there? If you have an antimicrobial and you add more and more to that, you might overwhelm the wastewater treatment process. And then in the process of doing that, you uh, prevent effective treatment and recovery of wastewater. So the antimicrobials, after being used in soap, end up first in wastewater, they persist during treatment, they go into raw drinking water, they go into groundwater, they accumulate in aquatic organisms like fish, even things that we eat, and um, if uh, the sewage sludge gets applied on land, on agricultural land, then these antimicrobials also can be integrated in crops that again end up in the food supply. And so you see there is a cycle, if we design chemicals that are very persistent and not um, compatible with natural degradation processes, then these chemicals can go around and around and end up in a lot of places where we don't want them. All right, so here we are at the tail end of the wastewater treatment plant and water that looks pretty clean is coming out there. We see it flowing over. And uh, so this is really the end of treatment at the beginning of uh, the water cycle again, right? It is. We're at the, what we call our Trish Rios wetlands. So We've been through the liquid process of, and the physical and the chemical and treatment that we saw at, the, at what we call the main plant. Um, and so now we're here where we send uh, at least half of the water comes to the Tres Rios wetlands uh, where we kind of let nature do its thing. Really, we're just returning the water to nature where it came from. You might wonder why do we care about this? Well, the antimicrobials are killing bacteria. And bacteria like to fight against uh, this stress, this chemical stress. And so um, if they succeed in that, they develop resistance, not only to the antimicrobials that are present in the soap, but also they become cross-resistant to antibiotics that are used by your clinician and your doctor to save you, know, you from uh, harmful infection. And so we cannot afford to kind of diminish the effectiveness of antibiotics by using antimicrobial chemicals in uh, everyday household products. Government action to pull those antimicrobials out of many products is a major victory for researchers at ASU. But the story of antimicrobials is bigger, and so we'd like the consumer to still be aware that there's many other antimicrobial and antibacterial um, products that they can pick up in stores. These chemicals, all these products are not regulated by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration and hence the products are still there, although the, the FDA has decided that a lot of these chemicals do not work and pose risks that are um, really not justifying their use. And so what are these products? Um, you can look for school supplies, rulers, you can look for highlighters, um, shoes, sports shoes, um, jerseys, uh, so just about anything that can be coated with antimicrobials has fallen victim <laughs> to this application of this very persistent chemistry. And uh, that explains why we can measure antimicrobials in the bloodstream of just about every person, you know, that uh, walks on the planet. The new rules should mean fewer of these chemicals will be going into our sewage, our water supplies and our bodies. Of course, none of this means that you should give up on a good habit. The old rule still applies, you should wash your hands, <laughs> use regular water, you know, so soap, regular soap and water, 
um, works great and, uh, and that keeps you safe for the most part. You don't need antimicrobial chemicals in your personal care products unless your physician or your dentist you know, recommends their use. Drawing blood is usually part of your yearly health check. It's not usually painful, but sometimes they will need to draw several of those glass vials full of your blood to get what they need to do a whole list of tests. What if you could get a bigger, more powerful snapshot of your health from just one drop of blood? A tool that could check not just for a few diseases, but hundreds. A kind of test that might even be able to stop deadly outbreaks of germs that can spread and kill quickly. Probably the most important advance we could have in health, uh, generally, for the whole world, not just for people in the United States, is early detection of disease. We can just take a drop of blood and measure the antibodies that you have in your system at the time. Antibodies are the weapons of the immune system. They're like guided missiles attaching themselves to only one type of invader. Even after an infection is gone, these antibodies are still present to guard against another attack. When you get infected, your immune system amplifies the signal to that infection. So if we could take advantage of that, we can use you as an amplifier for this attack. Antibodies attach themselves to peptides, the small bits and pieces that a microbial invader is made of. And you have, at any given time, you have a billion different antibodies in you. But we figured out how to basically take those billion different ones, splay them out on a surface, and then measure how much of each one there are. And from that, basically get a fingerprint of what your immune status is. Dr. Stephen Johnston is an inventor at the ASU Biodesign Institute. His lab uses round silicone trays similar to those used in computer chips. This is a standard uh, array, a silicon-like array that Intel uses. And you can probably see these little squares on here. So instead of this going into your cell phone as a computer chip, we have 100,000 different peptides. These are little pieces of proteins. Researchers have discovered how to use these peptides as a sort of bait to see if a person's immune system has been exposed before. What we get is an image of your immune system. And what develops that is that on that array, we measure the amount of binding of antibodies to each of those 100,000 elements. And that's what can, makes your immunosignature at that point. And that's all there is to it. We do take this array here and we cut them into a standard slide so it can go into standard processing systems. What it is is you can just take a drop of blood from your a finger stick uh, or even saliva and we can take that, we just take a little hole punch of that off of a filter and we put it on these arrays. The antibodies come off that filter paper and they bind on that surface and then we wash it off and we detect the antibodies. So each of these squares is 125,000 spots. The green that you see is where the peptides are. If you got to zoom in, you'd see individual peptides. There are only a few microns across, so they're very, very small. The red indicates really high binding. So for this peptide, there are a lot of antibodies that tend to bind to that, uh, that particular peptide. What you get is a big, complex pattern. And in that pattern of, of spots and binding, you see information about what you've been exposed to, whether it's cancer, or disease, Alzheimer's. And by using mathematics, you can pull that pattern out and predict their health status. And the way we figure out what a disease signature is, is we take 100 people with breast cancer and 100 women without breast cancer, and we look at their immunosignatures and we say, what, what part of their signatures that the people with breast cancer always have that people without breast cancers don't have? And that becomes our diagnostic for breast cancer. It's very personal. We're taking your personal immunosignatures, we're watching your health, we're, we're watching for general signatures, but we're also watching for personal signatures that are changing over time. And I think what's important about this aspect is that almost every development in precision medicine to date has meant it's gonna cost a lot more. And here, our emphasis is on getting something that doesn't cost more, but could be very helpful. What we envision is that people would spend you know, $100, $200 a year during their yearly physical and get an immunosignature. And then they watch their own signature over time. And if there's a change from year to year, they would go back and get a more specific immunosignature to find out what that change relates to. And then if it's cancer or something, they can go find a specialist and say, can you give me 
a different sort of measurement. Can you scan me and see if there really is a tumor there? Remember, it detects disease early. And it, we've shown that we can detect an infection even before people have symptoms. Uh, so that's important. Particularly for something, if you recall in the Ebola outbreak, that what's happening is that people were already spreading the disease before they had symptoms or before they even knew it was Ebola. We would see that something like this could intervene where, let's say, you're measuring uh, the healthcare workers on a regular basis all the time to get them, as soon as they had showed any sign of Ebola, that you would treat or isolate them. And if you had such a technology available at the time of the Ebola outbreak, it would totally have changed the outcome of that disease at that time. I'm Professor Vanessa Ruiz, and what you've been seeing is Catalyst, our show about shaping the future, how research creates real-life results, and because our lives have always new problems that science can help to solve, we'll be back soon with more stories. Catalyst is supported by Knowledge Enterprise Development at Arizona State University. Advancing entrepreneurship, innovation, discovery, and knowledge for the public good. Subscribe to this channel to see more episodes of Catalyst on YouTube.